Thank you very much, Krishna, for that introduction. Um, I would um, particularly like to acknowledge Professor Penandra Jain, the council members of the ASAA, uh, and of course, uh, Professor Sen herself is chairing the session. And I'd like to thank all of you for the opportunity to speak with you this morning uh, about the white paper that uh, I've been working on with some colleagues uh, for the most part in Canberra, at least recently, uh, a white paper on Australia in the Asian century, uh, a project that's really been engaging me for the better part of the past nine months. Now, of course, I don't need to explain to this audience why the government commissioned a white paper on such a topic. It's people who are engaged with Asia in your professional and, of course, personal lives uh, and who are obviously passionate about Australia's relationship with our neighbours, you know better than me, why it's so important for Australia, and especially right now, to take this opportunity to think strategically about our shared futures. For uh, more than 36 years, this association has been explaining Asia to Australians, and of course, the other way around, while advocating greater engagement within our region. And I'm pleased to see from the submission to the white paper uh, your continuing advocacy and to see also that the passion that you hold for these things has not in any way dimmed over that past 36 years. Australia's re-emergence as the world's most dynamic economic region in recent years has of course focused minds around the world on the opportunities and the challenges in what is being termed the Asian century. People who'd previously not thought deeply about our region are now doing so. And this is a good thing. The power of the white paper process is already being felt. So let me begin by telling you a little bit about the white paper, a little bit about our thinking and a bit about the processes. I have only one slide and it'll stay on the screen throughout my remarks. Prime Minister commissioned the White Paper in September last year. She described it then as a national blueprint for a time of national change. That means that the product, of course, will be forward-looking. It also means that while it will likely offer some immediate insights that could lead to specific near-term initiatives, the more important aim of the White Paper is to provide a framework for policy development and indeed for other developments because this is not something that governments alone can deal with for developments in Australia over a reasonably long period of time. Such a framework is important because it certainly is the case that much of what's required for Australia to make the most of the Asian century will indeed require sustained effort over many years. Another notable feature of the White Paper is that it will be first and foremost a domestic policy document. Of course, it's being developed against the background of what's happening in our region. Uh, its focus is on guiding Australia's evolution, exploring what Australians can do, indeed what Australians must do, in order to enhance Australia's prosperity and the broader well-being of the Australian people in this Asian century. In our work, we've had to reflect on how the region has changed, and then we've had to think about how the region will likely evolve out to 2025 and beyond. Our terms of reference require us to do that. Our terms of reference then demand that we consider what this means, what these developments mean for Australia. And we need to do this thinking across a broad canvas. We need to consider the implications for our economy, and you can now look at the slide, our society and our culture, and for political and strategic matters and political and strategic relationships. And we've been giving some thought to the question of who needs to do what, as between or among governments, other institutions, business, uh, and individuals generally. As I said earlier, governments cannot do everything that needs to be done. That'll be obvious to all of you, but it's a point that I doubt is well understood in the broader community where there seems to be an increasing tendency to hold governments accountable for just about everything. As you also know well, <clears throat> Asia is not an homogenous entity, and that means that the many questions that we've been asked to consider 
need to take into account what's happening at a country level and indeed even at a regional and sub-regional level in those various countries. Now we've decided to focus our efforts on Australia's relationships with Indonesia, India, China, Japan, South Korea and Vietnam. But I want to emphasise that that does not mean that we're not thinking about Malaysia and Thailand, Singapore, and the emergence of Burma and all the other nations that form part of ASEAN. And indeed, we are thinking about ASEAN itself as an outstanding regional institution. Our focus on the six countries that I mentioned reflects the fact that they, have, they are experiencing a relatively rapid speed of development and that relatively rapid speed of development raises a number of strategic considerations. So that's the reason for our focus on those six nations. Now I'd like to share with you some of the recurring themes that have emerged from our broad consultation process. We've received a, a, about 270 substantial submissions from across Australian society, from business, from the education sector, or sectors, I should say, from arts and cultural organisations, and a good many from individuals who felt passionately enough about the report to want to have their say. Like your own submission, the vast majority were received in the early months of the year at a time when many Australians were either on holidays or otherwise disengaged from national debate. And I think that too is a sign of just how seriously Australia and Australians take getting this right. Not one of the submissions said that this is not something Australia should be doing, not one. The feedback has been overwhelmingly positive and I can say to you that in nearly three decades of policy work, this is the only project on which I've ever worked that has enjoyed anything like that sort of support and interest. The work of the White Paper falls under three major themes and you can see them forming the three dimensions of this picture. Clearly, the economics is a key part of our work, given the enormous shift in economic power that's occurring uh, and how that shift in economic power is affecting our own economy. From an economic perspective, we need to consider what further reform needs to be undertaken here in Australia to allow Australians to engage fully and to build prosperity in the Asian century. We also, as I said earlier, need to do some crystal ball gazing to predict what might happen in the region into the future and how those developments might affect us. But it's not all about the economy. Social and cultural considerations form the second part of the White Paper's direction. And that theme takes in the people-to-people -people links that are essential to building strong links with Asia. Uh, and I'll, I'll speak more about those in a moment. It also recognises the fact that Australians and people living in Asian nations need to know and they need to understand one another. And of course what we do in relation to education is a very big part of this story. The third pillar of the White Paper is the political and security. A lot of people have observed that Asia's growth means that for the first time Australia is facing a future in which our largest trading partner is not either a partner in a close alliance friendship or even the partner of a close Australian ally. I don't know that that matters much actually, but it's a development that's worth thinking about. Having China as our largest trading partner is different in some respects from what we've experienced for the past century or more. And we need to think also about the implications of having more and different voices of influence on the world stage as Asian nations, notably China and India, re-emerge as global economic players. Each of these three domains, the economic, the social, cultural and the political security or political strategic domains, involve significant overlap, obviously, and none of them should be viewed in isolation. Education, to take just one example, can't be pigeonholed as a social change phenomenon. It is, and it has always been, an economic activity also with implications for the structure of the workforce in particular and education also has implications for political and security matters and quite profound implications for political and security matters. 
But all of these concepts work in tandem with the things that make up the triangle in this diagram. And I'd, I'd like to now explain briefly why that's so important. It's often said of the Asian century that Australia is in the right place at the right time. And while that's true, it doesn't mean everything will just fall into place without thought. It's taken creativity and foresight to transform Australia uh, into the place that it is today. And it will take that same creativity and foresight to ensure that we make the most of the opportunities in the decades ahead. At the bottom of this triangle are the foundations upon which our prosperity has been built. What I like to call Australia's natural and created endowments. Natural endowments are the things that we can put down to luck, basically. And Australia has some big ones. Our immense mineral and energy reserves, our extensive agricultural land that stretches across diverse climate systems, and of course, our proximity to Asia. The countries with far fewer natural blessings than us have achieved enormous economic success also. Singapore provides an example of a first world economy that has only location and its people to point to as natural endowments. And our natural endowments are only a part of the story about how Australia builds its prosperity in the years ahead. Our created endowments, the things that have been put in place by Australians over the past two centuries will prove just as important. These created endowments are often overlooked. They're often taken for granted. And that may be because they've become so intrinsic to our society, so intrinsic we don't even think about them. But I'm referring to things like our independent judicial system, to our market orientation, to our democratic processes of governance, to our largely egalitarian social policies, to our multicultural society. These are all the things that make Australia an attractive place to live, uh, in which to invest and in which to do business, in which to study, to visit. All these things are important endowments that Australia has and which Australia, or Australians rather, have created. The Nobel laureate Douglas North puts it this way, that it's hardly surprising that the prosperity and vibrancy of a society would be derived from the quality of its created endowments or institutions. As he says, these institutions are society's rules of the game. They create structures for how people, businesses and authorities interact. And increasingly, created endowments are becoming strong determinants of the pattern of economic activity around the world. But these endowments at the bottom of these triangles don't translate automatically into product. Instead, they should be conceptualised as providing a base of support for the other things that determine prosperity of a people. In the middle of the diagram are the things that we've done to boost our own capabilities. Australia has prioritised the development of several capabilities that have allowed us to make something of our natural and created endowments. We've invested in skills, in infrastructure and in innovation. I'm referring also here to creativity, social cohesion and a universal public health care system, for example. And of course I'm referring to the way in which parliamentary democracy plays out, to national security and to our open external orientation. Generations of forward-looking Australians have laid the groundwork for Australia's transformation and our capacity to secure a place in the Asian region. But the extent to which those endowments and those capabilities translate into success really depends on the top tier of the picture at the apex. It's here that we would hope to find the most flexibility, the most creativity and individuality because it's here that government really gives way to individuals with Australians finding ways of making the most of opportunity. Before moving on, I should make a cautionary remark about both our natural and created endowments and also about the capabilities that have been constructed upon them. Whilst there is a tendency, as I said, to take this stuff for granted, none of it should. Our abundant natural resource endowments are not inexhaustible, even though earlier generations of Australians and most of the present generations of Australians act and have acted as if they were. And what has been constructed in strong capabilities 
through policy reforms over many years can quickly be undone, more or less at the stroke of a legislator's pen. I should also say that we should not kid ourselves into thinking that previous generations of Australians have built capability for all. They have not. Our egalitarian ethos is a valuable asset. But the truth is that it's done little to address increasingly obvious instances of entrenched capability deprivation, especially among Indigenous Australians. And the present debate on our treatment of those who seek refuge in our country also provides reason for questioning the robustness of some of the norms that we might want to take for granted. None of this should be taken for granted. Back to the framework. And to help make some sense of these enormous concepts, the White Paper Task Force has developed a scaffolding that helps support the entire white paper structure. Your area of interest, what we might call broadly Asia literacy, uh, both in terms of language uh, and in terms of cultural understanding, that area of interest forms a very sizable bit of the scaffolding that I'm talking about. It was one of the most prominent issues raised in the submissions and in our extensive consultation process. And not only because many linguists are passionate about promoting bilingualism, which is what you'd expect, or only because schools want to uh, enhance exchange programs to give their students a bit of variety, which is also sensible, the things we call Asia-relevant capabilities, some of them have a hard edge. They're the fu fundamentals that will drive economic growth in the years ahead. It's shorthand for the skills Australians will need now and into the future if we're to prosper as a result of the shift in economic and cultural activity that's occurring around the world, this shift to our region. Education at all levels is clearly an important element when we think about our capabilities. And already it's played an important role in bringing us to where we are today as a nation. The years of work by people like those in this association to establish quality Asian studies in Australian universities has been especially important. It's just one example, albeit an important one, as I've said, of the micro-level decisions at the top of the triangle that will have an impact well beyond the individual. And the impact of Australia's university system more broadly in helping to form deep and long-lasting relationships with the region through education is immense. From the Colombo Plan in the 1950s through to today where we have more than half a million international students in our universities, and most of these from Asia. And the Australian government is providing nearly 4,500 scholarships to students in Asia every year, more than 4,500 scholarships. Many people we've spoken to have said that more needs to be done to ensure that Australians are making the journey in the other direction. That is, Australian students studying in countries in our region. Just as it's been vital to bring us to this point, education will be critically important in the future to nurture and to strengthen a dynamic, outward-looking, highly skilled and entrepreneurial workforce. There's little doubt that building Asia-relevant capabilities will also require world-class schools and it will require world-class vocational training as well as world-class higher education. We need to ensure that all Australians can access quality education at all stages of their lives, and in particular that they have a full understanding of Asia's diversity and of Asia's importance. Australians need to be able to look across our neighbourhood, to learn from others what they are doing well and to find ways to work collaboratively with them. That's something uh, our, our friends in South Korea are already embracing, and many of you would be very familiar with this. One might think, those who are not familiar with it, that as home to one of the highest performing education systems in the world, Korea might be happy to sit back and bask in its success, but in fact, just the opposite is happening. South Korea recognises that the world is changing and because of that, South Korea is looking critically at its own ways of doing things. So it's clear that it's not only Australians who are going through this process of thinking about how we can do things, even the things at which we excel, uh, even better in the decades ahead. For us, developing that knowledge of Asia from an early age at school should be a priority. We need to enable those who want to know more about Asia to learn through school, through vocational education and through higher education and then into their workplaces. Studies of Asia can no longer 
in my opinion, be considered an optional extra. These need to be embedded into the curriculum that our kids learn at all stages of their schooling. These are aspirations, yes, and I know that being here among you, I've been preaching to the choir to some extent. And I want to assure you that those working on the white paper don't underestimate the challenges we face. And you know those challenges better than we do. Uh, your report in 2002, Maximising Australia's Asian Knowledge, sounded a warning bell about the declining state of Asian studies in Australia. A decade ago, you knew, you knew already what perhaps the rest of the country is now, just now, becoming aware of. Now, unfortunately, a decade on, 2012, in your submission to the White Paper, you have to describe the situation as a crisis. We do need to find ways to encourage our people, young and old, to engage with the region with greater understanding. That cannot be left up to those of you for whom Asia is a passion. The new Asian school curriculum provides a place to start. The new Australian, I'm sorry, Australian school curriculum. Maybe, maybe, that was a, maybe that was an appropriate slip. The new Australian school curriculum provides a place to start. In July last year, it was agreed by all Australian governments that there would be an Asia focus in that curriculum. Asia and Australia's engagement with Asia is now one of only three cross-curriculum priorities in that curriculum providing the framework to embed Asia literacy in our school system. That's an encouraging sign, but it's only a first step. More needs to be done, and it needs to be done over a sustained period to ensure that the reality faced by our children in the classroom really does change. Ensuring that all Australian students have the opportunity to learn about Asia will help create the demand for acquiring deeper knowledge. It can act as a gateway, if you like, for more Australians to move on to higher levels of study, potentially gaining language fluency and cross-disciplinary expertise about Asia. Demand for business, we need to think about the demand side as well, will likely play a role too, as it increasingly understands the need for business, for people, I'm sorry, who can operate in cultures, in languages and in mindsets other than those to be found amongst the Australian population generally today. And there have been pockets of success, in particular universities such as the University of Melbourne and the University of Western Australia have made structural changes to their undergraduate courses that have driven an increase in language learning. But we need to make sure that teachers can match the demand. I understand that UWA, and Christian will be able to correct me if I'm wrong, had to cut off first year enrolment in Indonesian and Japanese because it exceeded teacher capacity. Koreans. <laughs> there you go, Korean, not Indonesian. Well, of course not Indonesian. I get the sense, too, that Australians are ready for this. There's certainly been enormous interest in the white paper project. It might have taken some longer than for this audience, but the idea that Australia's future lies squarely in and with Asia is gaining currency among Australians. We seem to have moved on from debates about whether or not Australia is a part of Asia. We seem to have recognised that whatever the geography, Asia is where Australia's future lies. I've focused a bit on education, but the concept I began with of Asia-relevant capabilities takes us well beyond the education systems. It includes having the right skills in our workforces, the right workplace settings to allow flexibility and agility in business, and it means having the knowledge of the legal, the business and the public sector environment of Asian nations. In short, the understanding that not everyone does things the way that we do, and also the understanding that in spite of that, we can work together. Of course, very little of the change we're talking about happens without close personal connections between people from the region. And again, we've heard quite a bit about the need to build personal relationships in our region as a path to achieving success across many areas, in business, in politics, in education, of course, in the arts and culture generally. Again, a micro-level decision, but with, or a set of micro-level decisions, but with macro impacts. There does appear to be a general sense in both government and business that re their relationships in the region are reasonably well developed. But both sectors would say to us, and have said to us, that there is substantial room for improvement. But it's what we're hearing in the personal relationships 
that stands out. What we're hearing is that personal relationships could be much better developed. Indonesia has been referred to a lot in this sort of discussion. Australian businesses have begun to understand the vast opportunities available in Indonesia. The Indonesian economy is already larger than the Australian economy. But the perceptions that many Australians have of Indonesia lags well behind the reality. We do need to inject new vitality into what my uh, advisory panel colleague on the white paper, John Denton, likes to call second track diplomacy. The institutional links that enable countries to foster real understanding of one another and put historic stereotypes and prejudices into the past where they truly belong. One of the constraints we've faced in the past decade in relation to Indonesia in particular has been the security situation and the advice provided to Australian tourists to reconsider the need to travel there. I'm not making any criticism of that warning. It is, of course, incumbent upon Australian governments that they seek to ensure the safety of their citizens. But now that that travel advisory has been adjusted, it does open up more opportunities for student and teacher exchanges and other professional exchanges in both the private and the public sectors. Across the areas of analysis in the white paper, a single word keeps cropping up, and this word is integration. Integration within the region is what's happening on a daily basis. Integration does not mean creating some great homogenous society, does not mean imposing the values and culture of any one country upon the people of another, and that is not what's happening. What's happening in the region is largely an economic integration, building on the progress made in the post-World War II period. That integration has to be taken further. We need to think about how we remove the remaining barriers to trade, to investment, to cross-border innovation. We need to think about how we move towards a harmonised body of regulation that would enable, enable firms across the region to form productive supply chains. To make the most of the economic integration forces, we need to build up the Asia-relevant capabilities that I was speaking of earlier. And that is an important aspect of what this white paper intends to do. It intends to shine a light on what we need to do right across the community, in government, in institutions, in business, and at an individual level, to be a part of Asia's future through the development of Asia-relevant capabilities. The White Paper will also explore concepts of collaboration, of cooperation, of partnership, of the need to match capabilities with those in our region. These are the words that will be part of the economic language of this century, just as international competitiveness was the language of the last quarter of the last century. For example, an Australian factory might not be making entire finished products anymore. Instead, it might be using its specialist skills to make vital components of that finished product. It might be a car component, for example, rather than a car, a component that connects into a supply chain overseas. That's an example, by the way, that's already happening, of partnership and it's an example of matching capabilities. The consequence for the Australian business is that it genuinely becomes part of a production process in Asia. When I was in China earlier this year, I met with the architectural firm, or a senior partner of the architectural firm, Woods Baggett. Many of you would be familiar with that architectural firm, a multinational. Woods Baggett is doing an enormous amount of work in China. The contracts they're winning are creating opportunities for Australians too, because it turns out that Woods Baggett is employing Australian architects in Beijing. The reason they're doing this is not because there's a desperate shortage of architects or engineers in China. China has plenty of architects, it has plenty of engineers. The reason, the reason is the design creativity of the Australian architects, architects trained here in Australia. And Woods Baggett has found that it needs architects with design vision, creativity, and they're importing that into their Chinese operations rather than then seeking to find that design creativity domestically. But it's not only economic integration. As China, India and the ASEAN group of nations establish the world's largest ever consumer market, a consumer market which by 2030 
will have more than three billion middle class consumers in it. As that happens, we will see more of the diverse and fascinating cultures of the region in the goods we buy, the services we consume, and in the way we do things on a daily basis. There is no Australian who will not be affected by these developments. This future is a long way from the 1970s and the 1980s, when the biggest impact that Australia had on most Australians' daily lives was in affecting their choice of the brand of car that they might own. <clears throat> These days, developments in Asia are affecting just about all aspects of our lives in one way or another. Half the world's population lives in Asia. 60% of the world's population lives in the same time zone as Australia's west coast. 60% of the world's population lives in that same time zone. In the past 20 years, China and India have almost tripled their share of the global economy. And they've increased their absolute economic size almost nine times over in 20 years. 40% of global economic activity now occurs in Asia. And by the middle of the century, more than half the world's output will be produced in Asia, which takes us back to where the world was as long ago as 1820. To put those figures in perspective, consider this. The Industrial Revolution in 18th century Britain changed the world, as you all know, and it remade the way that people worked and lived globally. In that time, the economy of a country of 7.5 million people grew by a factor of four in the space of 70 years. In the Industrial Revolution, a country of 7.5 million people grew by a factor of four in a period of 70 years. By comparison, the Chinese economy, a country of 1.3 billion people, has grown by a factor of 20 in the past 25 years alone. When people say we've seen nothing like this before, they're not kidding. It's a staggering achievement, and it is one that has lifted tens of millions of people, maybe hundreds of millions of people, out of poverty. Today, <clears throat> there are already 500 million middle-class people in Asia. <clears throat> By 2020, that's expected to rise to 1.7 billion people, and as I said earlier, by 2030, there will be more than 3 billion middle-class people living in the Asian region. Those enormous economic gains have enabled many countries in our region to improve massively the quality of education, of health, and overall standards of living of their people. You know, nearly three quarters of Australia's exports today go to Asia. Nearly three quarters. And half of Australia's imports come from Asia. On a human level, <clears throat> last year, for the first time in our history, the majority of migrants choosing to make Australia their home, or sorry, the largest group of migrants choosing to make Australia their home came not from the United Kingdom, but from China. And there are now more speakers of Mandarin and Cantonese in Australia than there are even of Italian and Greek. Southeast Asia is the most common region that Australians visit. And that's why it's important that we get our economic and social settings right to be in a position to make the most of the opportunities that come our way. Let me conclude. For all of our success in the past, none of this changes the fact that change is not easy, and of course, reform is harder still. And this white paper that we're finalising now is just the beginning of what should be a long process of reform. We're in the starting blocks, that's how it feels. We're certainly not in the home straight. The white paper will identify policy principles to guide government action in the years ahead. Pathways to deliver real policy change will also be set out. And what's delivered will not be a report from me. That is, what, published, what is published will not be a report from me. It will not be an advisory panel report. It will not be a public service report. It will be a report of the government. It's a white paper. It will set out with full cabinet approval the government's thinking and the government's intentions over a long period of time. And as with all statements of government intent, it will, of course, have to live within the constraints of the federal budget, but again, over a long period of time. As I mentioned earlier, the white paper is about laying down the path for where we should be going out to 2025 and beyond. 
Some of that path will be in short-term view. Other bits might take a few years to emerge. Others might take a decade. But it is my sincere hope that with this white paper we'll have created a roadmap that stands the test of time. The test will be when people look back in five or ten years' time or even longer and see how Australia has responded. The test will be whether Australians have adopted a new mindset for the Asian century, because that is what's required, a new mindset. I think the prospects are good. The timing is right. Australians are ready to have a serious discussion about these matters. The concept of the Asian century is already commonplace. It certainly doesn't seem that we any longer need to convince people of where our future lies. You in this room have always got it, and it seems that increasingly all Australians are getting it. It's a fair indication that times have changed when we have both sides of politics now talking about things like teaching Asian languages to school children and needing to build closer political and diplomatic ties with our neighbours. It's an exciting time to be involved in Asia. The statistics alone attest to that, and you're at the forefront of it. Thank you again for the invitation to speak here today. It really is a time for optimism, as I've said. As teachers and scholars of Asia, I hope you too are seeing a change in attitudes. And may that translate into an increase in the number of students who seek you out. And there's never been a more important time for Australians to understand broadly and deeply the vast and diverse region in which we all live. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, and uh, glad to speak to you. Uh, I have distributed to the, um, uh, through Sylvie, your conference organisers, uh, my speaking notes. Uh, I'll be touching on them briefly, but uh, anyone is free to draw on them if they want to. But five minutes is not much. Uh, those speakers' notes draw very much on the submission which a friend of mine, Greg Dodds, and I made to the Ken Henry Review and we called it basically going on smoko. Uh, and what the case was that uh, we reached a high watermark in the late 80s, early 90s in relations with Asia, language studies, business and recruitment, and then we went on smoko. My worry, and I believe it is important that we don't go on smoko again. Uh, this is a great opportunity of, from the Henry uh, report. A central problem we have in our relations with Asia is that as a, we were settled as a small, white, English-speaking community, and we are still in fear of Asia. That uh, is a central problem for us and how we adjust uh, to it. We are enriched by our cultural heritage, but we're also trapped by it. And our relations with Asia is difficult for a country that has that sort of background, despite the progress that we've made in many ways uh, in this country. We may have broken the back of white Australia, but it still keeps raising its head time and time again. And the debate we're having now about asylum seekers is really a proxy for a debate about white Australia. We have in this country concerns of now about uh, Chinese investment, particularly in agriculture, it's really a replay of the arguments that we saw against Japanese investment 40, uh, 20 and 30 years ago. It seems counterintuitive when one considers the number of students, the trade, the visitors to this country that in fact my case is that we've gone backwards in terms of engagement with Asia over the last uh, 15 or 20 years. Uh, language learning, cultural learning about Asia, I think, is no further advanced than it was uh, at that time, uh, 10 uh, or 15 or even 20 years ago. We had the Ghana report, we had the Ingelson report, the high watermarks, but I think we've retreated somewhat uh, since then. The national language policy of the Hawke government uh, and others uh, following on uh, has really run into the sand. Japanese language learning is in crisis, which I've taken some interest in. We had a working holiday program with Japan established in 1980. We didn't have another one with Korea in Asia with Korea until 1996. Uh, the question is, I ask myself, why did we go on Smoko? 
and I think we have gone on smoko in our relations uh, with Asia. I think the first is that uh, the rate of change in the first the Fraser government uh, cracking the back of white Australia, then the Hawke-Keating uh, changes were quite dramatic. And Paul Keating was no slouch either. You know, he was a latter-day convert, but he went full throttle once he understood the importance of Asia, a defence treaty with Indonesia, getting rid of the British monarchy so that we can properly engage ourselves in Asia. But all that change, in my view, was not well managed. And the Australian people became concerned about that rate of change. And it was ready-made for John Howard to say in the 1996 election, he promised us that we could be, his phrase was, relaxed and comfortable again. That's when I believe we went on smoko and the, the attacks on Asian migration, the, 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 the whistleblowing that, uh, that, that went with it, uh, the attacks on multiculturalism, that is when I think we saw that watershed uh, in our relations and development with Asia. Uh, the biggest failure, in my view, has been in the business sector, and I'm hoping that the Henry Report will address that issue. Lang language learning, Asian language learning, is important in itself, in its own right. But at the end of the day, for many people, there have to be employment opportunities. And that has not been provided, uh, in my view, by the business sector in Australia. Uh, and that became very clear uh, when I read the submissions made to the Henry Review that uh, in many respects the business sector is no longer, is, is certainly has not responded uh, in surveys that I've seen. I don't, there are only four major Australian companies that made a submission to the Henry Review. That to me says a great deal about how they see uh, our arrangements, uh, our integration into Asia. I see a large number of senior Japanese, Chinese and other business people in Australia. And I asked one of them the, the other day who's regularly is dealing with Austra senior Australian business people and I said, how, how many have you met in your three years here that can speak Japanese, Chinese or another language? And he said, not one. Not one. They have not become engaged uh, in this issue. They talk about the need for productivity, but they've not skilled themselves uh, in the languages that are necessary. And you cannot develop long-term trust and relationships through an intermediary. I guess it's like lovemaking. You can't do it with an interpreter in the bed. Uh, and we need that sort of close relationship with the skills uh, in our business sector. Uh, we cannot hope, of course, that uh, those skills will come from the mining sector, uh, the one sector that above all else uh, has, uh, is the leader in our trade relations with the region. And in this paper, I've referred somewhat provocatively to our mining leaders as the new conquistadors uh, in Australia, uh, who have no long-term commitment to uh, development in this country. It's a question of extracting the resources and then moving on. And they're even more successful uh, than, the, the, than the conquistadors of, uh, South, of uh, Portugal and Spain in South America. They got rid of one prime minister and with $22 million uh, advertising fund, they've saved themselves $66 billion. Uh, in, so the, the business sector, I think, is a major issue. In short, and I'm getting the signal to round up. I could go on for a while, I think. Uh, the key is for this country to be open, open to trade, open to investment, open to languages, open to a whole range of opportunities in this country. We will never be it by closing this country. We must be open to our region and that requires a substantial mindset. Thank you, uh, Christopher, for having me here, and uh, thank you to Ken and uh, John for their uh, wisdom. I just want to make three uh, preliminary points. Uh, uh, I'm on record as saying back in 1988 that the Asian century had already begun. You don't have to measure centuries from the year zero. In a sense, the Asian century began with the reconstruction of Japan, followed by Korea, Taiwan, uh, you know, and China was down the track. 
uh, but uh, uh, it's not a new phenomenon. And it was that existing phenomenon uh, uh, which uh, uh, governments in the 80s and 90s in Australia that uh, John has alluded to seized onto and uh, built on, in particular, of course, with Ross uh, Garno's report. Interesting to think about that report, incidentally. It was called Australia and the Northeast Asian Ascendancy. Northeast Asia Ascendancy. Uh, we, we sought later to grow what was called a son of Ghana, but it didn't get anything like the same uh, traction in embracing the rest of Asia. A second um, uh, point uh, I'd make is the geographic one. I'm really glad that Ken has stopped his consideration at Bombay. Uh, I have uh, in my life had rather too much to do with West Asia, uh, and there is no good news uh, between uh, Bombay and Beirut, and there's not going to be for many, many years to come. Indeed, maybe it extends uh, not just to Beirut, but to London. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, the third thing I'd say is to endorse uh, entirely what John has said about the change of momentum uh, in the 90s. Uh, in my view, uh, what we saw in the 80s and the first half of the 90s was thoroughly conceptual, not uh, airy-fairy, but practical as well as conceptual uh, approach to engagement with Asia. From the mid-90s, uh, we went transactional. We did deals. We saw relationships in terms of deals. We measured success by deals and announcements daily and lost track of the, uh, of the bigger framework within which we were working because the deals were so, uh, uh, so productive. They returned so much to government that uh, it uh, uh, may have had no reason not to go on smoko, unfortunately. Uh, just on uh, Asian studies, firstly, uh, I spent most of my uh, working career in the public service in uh, working in or on Asia with a two-year uh, aberration in Israel. Uh, and uh, I was passionate about it then, and I am now. They were choices that I made from the end of the 1960s uh, onwards, uh, uh, and uh, uh, it, uh, I, re I retain that passion. But I have to say, uh, I have smatterings of half a dozen Asian languages, like you know, make sure the beer is cold, my friend will pay. Uh, 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 I never did learn to say, and if you put ice in that beer, I'll choke you. I should have done that. But I'm just not a linguist. Uh, unfortunately, I never was. I compensated for, by, for that by working very, very hard on Asian history. Please don't forget that. And especially don't forget the history of Asia since 1945. It is extraordinary and fascinating. Think back where it was in 1945 when the US determined at the end of the war that all the colonial regimes would be gone. They wouldn't support any of them. It didn't happen. They didn't get out. Uh, the point I'm making here is that the leaders of, the, of Asia today are people whose own thinking was shaped by all of that experience from 1945 onwards. They're still there. Uh, and uh, if you want to engage with them, this is always a great talking subject. I've talked to Krishna before about how in India a great way to engage people is to start talking about petition and was it a great bluff that was called. Uh, and they really do rise to that discussion. It's a way of engaging people, but more importantly, it's a way of understanding uh, where and why they are. The second point uh, I want to make is about Australia and the region. And I'll make three points about this. You know, there's an inclination to see Australia as a supplicant, um, an importuner, a demandeur, the lesser part of a relationship. Uh, and that's not so. Firstly, uh, no bilateral relationship is ever, ever one-sided. Every country wants something of another. Some people would think that Australia even wants something of Nauru. Uh, that illustrates my point uh, in an extreme way. Uh, but uh, no relationship is completely uh, asymmetric or one-sided. Secondly, um, uh, we uh, as a nation come to Asia with a lot. Ken has outlined our uh, uh, natural and uh, inherited endowments. Uh, 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 but to put it in short, uh, you know, we have, whatever it is, Ken, the 13th biggest economy in the world. We still have, for the moment, the 13th or 12th biggest defence budget, uh, an enormous aid budget, of course, uh, probably the seventh in the world as we're headed. Um, uh, we have, uh, as Paul Keating used to say, a continent of our own, and they're not making too many more of them. 
uh, th th and, and that is seen as an asset in Asia, incidentally. Uh, and we have all of those natural resources. We don't come naked to the table. Uh, when I was in China for those four years, uh, uh, there were people in Australia tremendously anxious about how dependent we'd become on China. And this amused me because in China, Chinese uh, uh, friends were talking about China becoming too dependent on Australia. Uh, it is a two-way thing and it has to be. And that's my third point under this uh, brief heading, and that is, um, uh, notwithstanding all of that, the Australian commentariat looks to Australia to take the initiative in the bilateral relationship. Australia needs to do more with India, China, Japan, whoever it is. We should certainly do more. I'm an advocate of that. But at the same time, we do have to ask and expect bilateral partners to do more too. I'll illustrate that with a reference to India. Um, it was commonly said for many years Australia had to try harder with India, uh, and that became part of the uh, mantra of uh, we Asianists. Uh, but recent work done by one of your academic colleagues in Melbourne, I don't think she is here, uh, uh, dragged out a whole lot of Australian government dispatches and so on from the 60s and 70s, uh, and uh, she's become a convert. She said, I missed all of this. Australia was actually trying its guts out with India all those years, with no success, of course, because we we're on the wrong side of the strategic divide. Um, there was no natural trading relationship and so on. But we were trying, uh, and, it, and it does take uh, uh, two parties to make those sorts of relationships work. And my third um, and final point here is all of this is essentially about foreign policy in the biggest sense. Ken's uh, slide um, uh, identified you know, three layers, political, strategic, economic, social and cultural. And yes, uh, foreign policy is in a sense, it's a mosaic of all of these things, people-to-people -people engagements, second tracks, all of that. You, you paint the mosaic with aid and trade, culture and so on. Uh, but there is a bigger concept of foreign policy, much bigger concept, that is very little understood in this country. We're not much taken with concepts. Uh, but it is how and where do you position the country uh, in the international uh, environment? So amid the tectonic shifts uh, that are taking, the, the, the shifts that are taking place in the tectonic plates of uh, geostrategy, or whatever you like to call it, at high politics, uh, the shift in all of that, how and where does Australia want to place itself uh, in the future? And that, of course, leads to the matter of uh, Australia-US-China, which uh, we don't have time to address now, but uh, will uh, later if you can. But in the meantime, let me say, that's the big issue for us. Where do we want to be when the music stops? How do we position ourselves? And uh, all of us are looking forward very much to Ken's report to help answer that question. Thank you. I want to begin with a quotation. And I've got a toffee apple for the person who can tell me where it comes from. The proper study of Asia and its languages is about national survival in an intensely competitive world. Proficiency in an Asian language and knowledge of the history, political and social cultures, economic systems and business practices of Asian countries is no longer a luxury for the few. If Australians are to come to terms with their geopolitical location and to manage their future as part of the Asia region, Asia literacy must be widespread. For this to be achieved, reforms and restructuring of the whole Australian education system from primary school through to universities is essential. Paragraph 1.1 of Asia and Australian Higher Education circa 1989, I wrote it. Um, <laughs> I, left a, I had originally had a draft, and I went back last night to look at the hand draft. My hand draft, written in 19, December 1988, had a, I had a sentence in which I took out because I thought it might offend too many people. It said, Australia is doomed to become a quarry with a view. <laughs> I took it out. I was delighted to hear Ken, Rooney, Ken Henry talk about long-term policy because what this country's lacked uh, in its relationship with Asia, and most importantly of all in its education policy, is any concept of long-term beyond the next election. In fact, long term has been seen as about two years, because that's about the average two and a half years of where elections come. The key to where, we, where the changes that we all want to have 
is not in the policy, because I'm sure that Ken will write a great policy, it's in the implementation. It's going to be in the implementation. Are we, do we have the widespread support among the political classes of Australia stretching down into the, uh, through the community to implement over a 10, 15 year period necessary structural reforms? And by structural, I don't just mean, I mean mentally structural, I mean educationally structural. And who is going to drive it? What is going to drive it? Which group is going to drive it? And I'll give you some examples of where we fell down, why we went smoker in the 1990s. When we finished this report, and um, I know that some of my colleagues at the time thought I, thought I was far too instrumentalist in my language, and I patiently explained that I was writing it for two people, uh, John Dawkins and the uh, uh, secretary of his department. Um, and um, as a result of that, in 1990, the Australian government set up a scholarship scheme, two scholarship schemes. One to send 20 postgraduate students into Asia each year on a competitive system for 12 months for field work. Didn't count towards the three and a half years you have for your scholarship. The other scheme was to put 100 Australian students a year to study an Asian language or in an Asian language in any country in Asia. I chaired that committee for four years. You'd be astonished at the quality of the people that applied. I had people uh, uh, that we just were astonished by, people who had high, de high, high distinction in every subject they'd done at university, played the piano to almost concert level, were sort of Australian netball players, and were working at the Matthew Talbot Hospital th uh, hostel three days a week looking after homeless people or doing something with kids. On a, on the, so they were fantastic people. And they wanted to go and spend 12 months in Thailand or in India and learn a language before they went back and did something uh, with their careers. We put 500 people out there over five years. And I want to study done of where those 500 people are now, 20 years later. Uh, I want to study done of where those 80 to 100 postgraduate students we sent out there are, we've got their names and addresses, we know them, we can chase them. Because after four years, as is the want of governments and bureaucrats, I had to say, in terms of implementation, somebody wanted to review it. And who did they send in to review? Now, I love accountants. <laughs> and, and I love auditors even more. There's nothing like a failed accountant. Um, and I won't mention the large company that actually did the job. But I had the misfortune of having to talk to this company who sent in two 12-year-olds to sort of do the job, <laughs> who looked me in the eye and said, what's the purpose of all this language learning? I had two illiterate and Asia illiterate people in front of me who were writing a report who wanted to know, could I prove that having spent two and a half million dollars a year of the Australian taxpayers' money for four years, we were getting value for money? I said, come back in 15 years' time and ask the same question. Uh, didn't go down too well. And that scheme was dropped. National Asian Studies Language Scheme, great scheme. We dropped it. I see the person who was in the cabinet that dropped it is now saying we ought to, we ought to do it. It's very interesting. <laughs> we, if we, we cannot have education policies that aren't integrated from primary school to universities, do not have long-term vision, do not have long-term commitment, and do not have outcomes that are measured over 10 or 15 years, not over five minutes. And it will not happen unless somebody drives it. Unless somebody, senior in the bureaucracy or in the government, has got the responsibility of saying, the Henry Report matters. The white paper matters, Australia's future does lie in Asia, somebody is, somebody is going to drive it and make sure it occurs. I, uh, in one of my incarnations, was partially heavily involved in the rewriting of the uh, history curriculum in New South Wales, the year 11 and 12 curriculum, and I still believe it's the best history curriculum in the country, I would say that, wouldn't I? Um, and we deliberately put into it quite a bit of Asia material. But, I, but I, looking back, I totally failed. Why? Because 
uh, when you look at who, what they did, what the students actually did, and what the teachers actually taught, as opposed to what you thought they should do, it's still a curriculum largely Eurocentric. What is the core 25% component of the New South Wales history curriculum? Hands up, it's what, if you went to school 25 years ago, it's exactly the same. It's the causes and out outcomes of the First World War. I couldn't shift it. Well, and it'll still be there in 25 years' time. Now, there's a very good reason why it's there. And, and those of us who want to change the education system should really think it through. And there's a very good reason. One is schools have got the resources. They spend a lot of money investing in resources. They worry about where they're going to get resources to do anything new. And that's a very realistic thing. Secondly, they've got teachers who are comfortable doing it. And they've got a literature out there that they can draw on, that teachers can teach. So to change that is going to be very hard. And it will not happen unless somebody drives it, unless somebody says that it's going to be uh, resourced properly over 10 to 15 year period. There's no point having a language policy uh, from schools that doesn't recognise that secondary schools draw upon primary schools and, high sc uh, 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 and universities draw upon secondary schools, so it has to be integrated. A second example before I sort of sit down about somebody has to drive it. We have a very good exchange program in Australian universities. It's grown exponentially over the last decade. Has anybody done a study of where they're going? I have for a few universities and I'll tell you where they're going. 80% or more of the students, Australian students go on exchange, go to Anglo countries. United States, Canada, or Britain, 80%. About another 10% go to Europe. Well, Amsterdam's nice. Um, very, very few go to Asia, any Asian country. And those that do, a significant proportion are people who, who are children of migrants who came to Australia recently. It's, and it's not for lack of money. The UMAP scheme is a good scheme. It doesn't use its funds all the time. The, the Endeavour scheme is a good scheme. But the first few years, you couldn't get enough people applying. It's the fact that a mindset is there inside the educational system that when you go and exchange, you go to an Anglo-speaking country because it's easier. And it's that mindset that we have to change. And it will be changed by long-term educational policies, by a a, and I hope that Dr. Henry put somewhere in, in the paper that the, the, the implementation of it is critical. Therefore, it's got to have bipartisan uh, political support. It must. And it must have wider support from us and the, and the community to, to ensure that. Why did we fail in the 1990s? I think I wrote something at the time saying I thought that uh, Keating and uh, those of us in Asian studies and those of us in the elite political and elite were far ahead of public opinion. Uh, we knew, thought we knew what we were talking about, Keating did, and we all talked about, you know, we got rid of white Australia, we got rid of this. No, we haven't, and we hadn't, and we hadn't percolated it down through the educational system. Who is going to drive the reforms that are so desperately needed, and how is it going to be driven, and what is the body that's going to drive it? You don't have you drive Australia's Olympic uh, achievements by without having an, a, an Australian Institute of Sport, and every every state's got one underneath. And then you don't expand uh, Australian football by just saying, "Isn't it nice to have an Australian Institute of Sport?" You actually do something about it, and if you see how they drive it, they drive it. Somebody drives it. So, in my view, everything is going to be the implementation. Otherwise, we'll just simply go through this endless cycle of saying that Australia must adjust to living with Asia and we'll have yet another situation where I think John Many is absolutely right, another proxy debate on the wide Australia policy over refugees or, or something else. Thank you.